Okay, welcome back to the AEC Hive podcast. I'm Ralph Montague, an architect by profession, firm consultant and director at ArcDocs. I'm also the co-founder of the AEC Hive community of innovators uh, in architecture, engineering and construction. I'm joined by my fellow AEC Hive co-founder, John Egan, who's the CEO of BIM Launcher. Today, we're going to do something a bit different uh, on this podcast. We're hosting a roundtable discussion between a group of experts and industry leaders in AEC information management to discuss the important topic of open exchanges of information containers. Our hope is to reach some consensus on the topic which could eventually lead to the development of an open standard for exchanging information containers. And this work will feed into the ongoing work at Building Smart that John's participating in, in the open CD API. So I'd like to introduce John Egan from BIM Launcher and co-founder of AC Hive, who's going to put forward the proposed topic of discussion. John? Thanks, Ralph. And um, hi to everyone. Thanks for taking the time. Um, so what problem were we trying to solve here today? The built environment and the buildings and infrastructure that make up the physical built assets are complex things and rely on accurate, available and organized information to effectively design, deliver and operate buildings. We have a set of international standards in the ISO 19650 series that suggest how we manage, organize and store this information in a common data environment or CDE. It is clear, however, to those of us who are experienced in using CDs that the real challenge is exchanging information between the growing number of solutions that make up the CD. And it is projected that the complexity of this problem is only set to increase as the adoption of digital solutions increases due to a requirement to work from home and thanks to the key instigator, COVID. As the smallest packet of purposeful information, the information container offers a vehicle to move information between the technology solutions to make the information accessible and available to all the relevant people when they need it. However, the digital infrastructure that mesh together these solutions and allow information containers to flow in the same way that HTML enables the internet to flow is not yet av available. And instead, the reality is that the information container exchange is manual, requiring upload and download, copy pasting of metadata and bespoke metadata mapping exercises in order to maintain the integrity of information containers between systems. This hugely erroneous and inefficient process is caused by each solution supporting a non-standard and specific proprietary data model that represents each information container and type thereof. The process is not only time consuming, but very loss heavy, even when done right. Human error can be the cause of lost information embodied through missing versions of metadata. Duplicated and outdated information, which adds excessive time and cost to the design and delivery of buildings and infrastructure. This not only undermines the intention of the value of the metadata, from the author on the original metadata on the original information container, but also poses safety risks and hinders our ability as an industry to deliver on connected data workflows, which are so fundamental to the progression of the concept of the digital twin and the value and the value it is expected to deliver. The discussion today is to see whether some consensus can be reached between the participants on this call on how exchanges of information could be vastly improved by having a common open standard for exchange of information containers that technology vendors can support and lead, the, lead to the potential of automated exchange of information, which will dramatically reduce the time and cost of constructing and operating buildings and infrastructure and reduce the safety risks of having outdated duplicate information. So, once again, I'd like to thank you all for uh, taking the time to discuss this quite important topic. Um, I'm going to run through the introductions. I thought that would be faster just for me to do it. Um, so in no particular order, I'm going to run through them. So on the call with us today, we have Peter Powells. He's an associate professor at Eindhoven University of Technology, formerly university, American interest information for the life cycle across architectural design, construction and building operation with a lot of experience and knowledge in computer science and software development. He is involved in a number of industry oriented research projects and topics affiliated to AI 
design and construction, design thinking, BIM, linked building data, linked data in architecture and construction, and semantic web technologies. He takes part with an interest on the data representations used for the information containers, JSON, RDF, etc. Also on the call, we have Andy Bootle. He's head of BIM at Keir, and he's engagement co-lead at UK BIM Alliance. Um, on the call, we have Mesut Pala. He's currently an information manager at Arup. Um, he previously worked at worked alongside ASight, and then as a freelance consultant for ASight in 2018-2019. His experience is in implementing enterprise-wide software, CDs, and document control systems. He completed his industrial doctorate degree in 2018 in supply chain management and information systems integration at Loughborough University. We also have Claudio Bengi. He's a research active academic pursuing excellence in education, research and enterprise. His research efforts are directed at establishing a mature digital ecosystem for the construction industry on which advances and on which advanced techniques can flourish for the betterment of the built and natural environment. In the first stage of this roadmap, he worked closely with standardization bodies and industrial partners for the development of open information frameworks for the built environment that spanned from the products to the processes. The second stage aims at improving project performance. This is pursued in two ways. The first via transparent and effective arrangement of stakeholder duties and deliverables. The second with methods to evaluate project outcomes against the expectations. Going forward, the final steps will leverage the growing availability of digital models and CDEs to investigate the use of AI in the broader domain of the built environment from architectural design to facility management in consideration of sustainable practices. Also on the call, we have Jerome Werbrook. He is a PhD researcher affiliated with the Ghent University and or WTH Aachen University, funded by FWO Flanders. His main research topic is the setup of an infrastructure for data-based federated building models based on semantic web technologies. As a basic infrastructure for such a federated CDE, the potential of the solid initiative, Timber, which is a Tim Berners-Lee project, the founder of the internet, um, is investigated as well as potential alternatives. To cope with the peculiarities of construction, this infrastructure is deliberately extended. Within this context, Jerome has worked on pattern-based access control and federated web contexts, the use of semantic query languages, validation of federated data, and documenting existing buildings using linked data. Also on the call, we have Mohamed Shana. He is the CEO and co-founder of Morta, a startup on a mission to bind capital project supply chains and transition the industry to automated data-centric workflows. In that capacity, he is working with the Centre of Digital Belt Britain on digitising ISO 19650 Part 2, as well as leading engagements on projects where Morta is being used as an end-to-end -end project management environment. Prior to founding Morta, he worked as an associate to the chief information officer of Consolidated Contractors Company, the largest contractor in the Middle East. There he was responsible for establishing best practices in data management and led the startup of the company's innovation and R&D initiative, where he established partnerships with startups in the fields of 3D printing, robotics, modularization and IoT. Also on the call, we have Lars Fredunland, founder and CEO of CoBuilder from Oslo, Norway, with a demonstrated history of working in the information technology and services industry. He is skilled in research, sustainability, strategic planning, and business development. Um, Lars also has experience in building standards from scratch and um, through his uh, uh, product data template and ISO standard, which is recently been published. Kelly Doyle is the COO for Project Ready from Austin, Texas. Project Ready empowers construction managers and design teams to deliver projects on time and on budget by connecting platforms. These platforms include SharePoint, Microsoft Teams, BIM360, Procore, BIM360 and Box. He connects or 
the co or the product connects workflows and connecting views around a single project ID, allowing multidisciplinary teams to securely communicate, collaborate, and delivery, deliver projects despite using various role-based software tools. Kelly has years of experience in construction technology, innovation, and consulting, and he also moderates for Digital Twins with the Construction Progress Coalition, where this project or where this discussion also began. So also on the call, we have Madhumita Sentival. Sorry, Madhumita, I hope that didn't, <laughs> I hope that was okay. Uh, Madhumita is a PhD researcher at RWH, RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Her PhD research is on linking, querying, and validating heterogeneous data. Her research focuses on exploring containerization of ICDDs in CDE. CDEs, GraphQL based of containers and container validation using Shackle. Presently, she is working as part of the Horizon 2020 BIM for REN project on BIM based tools for fast and efficient renovation. She earlier worked on the ISO 21597 Part 2 standard for extended link sets for information container for linked document delivery and implementation of computer vision and AI for construction monitoring. Her research interests include linked data for construction, AI and semantic web. She is taking part in the discussion today with an interest in information specifications for information containers, data representation, and meta architecture for same. Ulrich Hartmann also joins us on the call. He is a civil engineer and computers as a background in computer science. He's a product manager, an old BIM horse, and BIM expert with Oracle AConnex from Munich in Germany. So Ulrich is the group lead of the DINSPEC 91391 CDs for BIM projects, part one modules and function sets, part two open CDE API. So this is the German, so also there's an English version available. We'll also include that in the description for the podcast. And um, so this is a German pass standard for information exchange between solutions. He's also a group lead of the CDE follow-up of the DINSPEC part two at the SEN TC442 working group two TG4 on the open CDE API. He's a traveler between academia, academia and commercial, and he also does many BIM related research projects. He's a BIM enthusiast, consultant, trainer, writer, involved with BSI, DIN, VDI standards and working groups. Also on the call, do we have Paul Wilkinson? I don't believe we do. No, no I don't um, see Paul. No. Yeah. Okay, so also on the call and last but not least, Brian Tennyson. So Ryan is an infrastructure technology advisor at Scottish Future Trust. He is on the, he's a panel member at the IET Built Environment. He's a co-founder of Hack Construct, who have delivered a number of independent professional institute, con, institute construction tech sector hackathons. Within Scottish Future Trust, he leads and supports Scottish public sector clients on standardized project information procurement, delivery and management, with a primary focus on digital handover for whole life cycle asset operations, maintenance and performance. As part of the podcast, I believe uh, Ralph and I will be both co-moderating and the agenda that we hope to cover today um, will include a number of topics and discussion points. So what we would like to do is, or will the type of conversations that we'd like to have is discover topics like what is an information container specifically interested if anyone like would like to um, disagree or uh, contradict my fairly simple overview of what an information container is as the smallest body of information that or purposeful information that can be exchanged between systems why it is important to have metadata about the information container um, would like to understand if there's broad agreement around the types of information that needs to be exchanged between systems. 
um, including or to maintain integrity and trustworthiness of the information and discuss topics around authorship, approval, acceptance, purpose, transaction, transactional audit and provenance data, etc. Um, we'd also like to talk about the types of information containers and can we come to some sort of agreement around that, i.e. what are the information containers going to be uh, describing models, drawings or uh, forms of information like requests for information and product data sheets, etc. Um, can this information be expressed using IFC? Um, can it be exposed as a web service through BSDD, the Building Smart Data Dictionary, or as an MVD as per a Colby document? Um, once again, well, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. So yeah, we'd like to introduce and and bring bring to the table um, many or as many perspectives on existing technologies um, that may be available to solve these problems that we're trying to talk about. And also we'd like to talk about the stakeholders and specifically talking about their incentive the incentive for solution vendors, what kind of change is required in their business models, and do we need to rethink the value proposition for them in order to shift the industry um, perspective and, and uh, encourage the adoption of information containers. So as a general format, what I'd like to do is invite each participant to give a brief response to the problem statement that I've presented um, before the um, uh, introductions. So I'd like you to take one or two minutes to just give your own perspective on, um, on, on, on a requirement, whether you think this is a worthwhile initiative. Um, do you see a day-to-day -day challenge with the fact that information can't be efficiently exchanged between solutions? And specifically for people that are involved in st standards in academia, I'd like to know how your area of expertise and any standards that you've been developed, um, been developing or working with um, can help respond to the requirement for an open information container exchange. And for industry and vendors, I'd like to invite you to, um, to talk about, talk, talk, about how you believe that a successful information container exchange protocol can help you deliver better project outcomes for your customers and, and other stakeholders that are involved um, with the use of your software. Um, and then I would, yeah, I, I pretty much, I'd like to open up, open it, following that, I'd like to open up discussion. Um, once again, the Actual input from each of you is optional, but uh, um, you're all here for 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 a reason. Uh, so I am. We're. I think that both I, Ralph, and the community, and uh, and everyone else here is really interested in your perspective and opinion. And um, so, just on my screen, I'm going to start with um, Cla I've Claudio at the top left, um, Ulrich. Jerome on the top row, and that's going to be one, two, and three. Uh, so I'd like to start with you, Claudio, please. Hello, hi. Oh, this is so not fair. Um, <laughs> you had a very long text prepared, whereas I was trying, I was hoping to have a more fluid conversation today, so I didn't have um, so much of a prepared statement, but um, I've taken a few notes in um, that I would like to uh, discuss. So let's let's start from the main idea of the business model. I think that's the most intriguing um, entry point to this conversation. Um, perhaps it's not the most technical angle, okay, which we might have uh, time to discuss later, but. I guess it's uh, quite interesting for us to see what the outcome of um, a successful um, definition of a standard in this domain might be. Um, and that conversation starts from um, a question that we need to answer as to who owns the data that we are uh, moving around. Now, of course, the industry works around clear intellectual property agreements uh, in one sense. 
Uh, but in the other, we know that um, <clears throat> this is perhaps true from the construction side of things, but the information technology side of things works quite differently. Um, in um, you know the, the the great information containers, the the, the great information accumulators in the world are, have, a, have a business model that is very much different from the one that we are used to know that traditionally our um, our um, economies uh, know. And so um, I think it's quite important that um, as users of this system, we take um, quite a robust stand when it comes to defining the the boundaries that um, the people that hold our data can um, um, can can oh, will will have to remain within. So um, when when we are exchanging this data through these systems, um, and not, I'm not talking about the interaction at the, 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 of the standard that we, that we are still hoping to define, but you know the big. Uh, the big databases that are being developed right now to, to hold our formats and our information. Well, what level of control do we have on, on, on the um, intelligence that can be uh, achieved uh, mining them? Um, and so the next, you know, once we have discussed this, the next point would be, um, will these people find a business model so that they don't rely on um, on, on the mere fact that they have this data uh, to um, and that and that uh, instead provide interesting services around this. So the business model might become not just holding the data, but providing um, providing uh, added value to the supply chain on the top of that data. Um, so these are the converse, you know, these are the entry points from me from a commercial standpoint. Uh, angle that uh, are quite quite interesting because, um, like I said, because there is this strong dichotomy uh, that we observe in the construction versus information technology domain, and when these two significantly different domains will come together, um, there will there's going to be a, an important need for reconciliation uh, so that uh, we are all clear uh, on on what can be done and what should be done and what will be done. With information that we share, um, because well, there is intellectual property agreements that um, are are quite important in the in our industry in the construction industry. Um, so I think this is the entry point. I don't want to speak too long. Perhaps uh, I can leave somebody else the game now. Yeah, Ulrich. Me. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um. I mean, uh, really an <laughs> interesting group here. Very um, excited about this. Um, yes, uh, my points on this um, information container problem, so to say. We have many, many groups uh, where I'm partly uh, in uh, who discuss this uh, topic. Like, uh, as you mentioned, John, this DINSPEC stuff is about information containers. We have a group in BSI talking about this. I have a group uh, in, in the SEN uh, talking about open API standards and so. Uh, all this is about uh, interconnectivity and um, openness of data. So <clears throat> from my perspective, um, the main concerns people have is um, doubts about intellectual properties and so um, data sovereignty. But um, there is a big issue about what is exactly the business model for working closely together. It's uh, most uh, people still thinking in silos, uh, and this is a business model to keep everything in their um, silo. Um, and uh, of course, there are technical hurdles like formats, APIs, and so we have to bridge it somehow. So <clears throat> in general, I think people are not aware that um, if we put all things together in a, in a big uh, consistent uh, workflow environment, that this might be uh, an appropriate and even better business model. And uh, if we could explain this, uh, the the layout of some information containers 
will be just a technical step. But as I experience this every day, I can say um, the main concerns are about um, what is my gain if I have some openness in this whole uh, workflow arena. So um, yeah, th that's my, my main mm. point, mostly psychology maybe and business model and and that's um not to underestimate as a as an obstacle right thanks Ulrich. uh jerome could you share please yeah um thanks for the introduction and for uh the two other persons who already uh gave me some time to think about it um yeah, so from my point, it's a, an academic point of view, so I don't really have experience in industry or in um, and in that way, I'm I may be uh, too much biased towards let's just share our information and uh, everyone is happy. So, um, um, but but from that point of view, um, I'm really in favor of um, the initiative to share more information because that's the only thing I think um, or, or one, one of the most important things that's needed to really get to the next level of interoperability and also of automation. So just not exchange information, but exchange machine readable information uh, so that as much use cases as possible or as desirable can uh, get automated, can get some kind of um, microservice that is independent from the, the CDEs to work on data that is nevertheless provided by the CDEs. So in this sense, I think as a of a CDE as like a, it's just a service hosting information about the project that is used by um, some stakeholders and other stakeholders can use another uh, CDE. But in the same, in, in this way, when we have this kind of patchwork with different stakeholders, each one using a dedicated CDE for different projects, collaborating with other stakeholders who also have different CDEs, we, we get this kind of patchwork. And I think that's maybe the only possible way to work because everyone is like an independent stakeholder. So um, my opinion is that we, might start looking at this as a fact as this uh, to this patchwork and see just the cdes that um we or that any stakeholder hosts their information on as um just a service with contextual or uh, project information just like in other information geospatial information um maybe even the wikipedia information or elsewhere so um is equally a part of the project in a sense so um, I think in, in making this kind of abstraction, so not really looking at CDEs are uh, containing um, the project information and then all the rest is like um, just just tiny links. We should look at just this, this uh, undefined cloud of information that is quite, uh, that's not really um, pinpointable, <laughs> I'd say. Um, so you have this this kind of federated building model which needs to exchange information and you could um, draw in information from Wikipedia as you could draw information in from uh, a CVE, from an IEC file, from any uh, standard that we have already. So and the reason I and, and some others in this call as well uh, are looking at the semantic web is that it's um, discipline agnostic. So we, we try to to cut it a bit loose from from the IEC AEC industry from construction from design um, but connect it to virtually any other possible information which allows us to make this kind of this network which is discipline agnostic making it possible to link to data that might not seem um, interesting in the first building phase but, but might become interesting in like 10 20 years when the building is demolished or um, so so um, my view there is that information containers just let's let's try to wrap up because I'm, I'm just talking here um, 
information containers are not really um, data itself or, or, or building data itself, or at, at least not in the first place, but it's, it's more about sending queries. So I send a query to your uh, your um, CDE in a, dis in a discipline agnostic language, which might be semantic web based. And the um, information you send back to me from your CDE or from uh, someone else's uh, common data environment is always an answer, but the information itself doesn't transfer from um, an ownership point of view. It's just like, okay, I show my information to you, so your application, your use case that you need this information for can use it, but it stays at my CDE. So in this way, it's always an answer on a query um, rather than, than copying it into my CDE. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Lars, um, you're next, <laughs> please. Okay, so uh, uh, firstly, I just have to say that I have not been a uh, lot involved in uh, CDE work. I joined the first Building Smart meeting and then I went out of the meeting. Uh, so I have, uh, since then, I've heard, I know very little. But my comments to, to the discussion is maybe first start up with to say that uh, we should have a topic which is uh, uh, a, I mean from a holistic point of view uh, covers the life cycle of assets firstly. So it's important it's not uh, design uh, construction uh, topics we discuss. So that includes uh, circularity, EU's Green Deal, uh, as well as uh, a lot of other information needs. Uh, different people have uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, that are working with and um, as, is a part of both design, construction, operations, whatever. So <clears throat> I think the information is, is kind of, if you just look at it from a CDE perspective, I think uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's a too narrow discussion, I would say. Secondly, I think we need to uh, understand uh, what tools should solve what and not mix things together. So very often I see that people are mixing. Uh, they're putting a lot of efforts into pushing data via channels that are not fit for purpose. In that I mean BIM. So data in BIM that is not needed should not be in BIM and should not be tried to be pushed via models like Revit to IFC and extension of IFC schemas and things like that. I think that is wrong. Uh, secondly, uh, I think the introduction of a common language is important so that there is a common language uh, back to the dictionary discussion. So the common language that we can provide uh, concepts. So in these discussions, we talk about information containers, but I think that we need to, to kind of enhance that language to talk about construction objects. Uh, we could talk about um, uh, uh, what information uh, is needed, uh, to whom, at what stage. Uh, there's a lot of different standards that are being implemented. People are talking about different ISO standards uh, uh, that are uh, overlapping each other. Not saying that uh, any of those standards is wrong, but we need to kind of have a clear view on what's what. And at the end of the day, we need to help the different stakeholders with um, getting digital. So that means that if I am a manufacturer, if I am a contractor, if I am a small or a large actor, client, owner, then how can we help uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in these discussions? So uh, then my final point would be that uh, Kobler, what we have been working on is in SEN and ISO to develop 
uh, a common way of defining, let's say, a document type, describing what the document is, uh, and developing GUIDs for that, and for that to be kind of translated or created within contexts to be used in between parties. So that's uh, a standard on, uh, it's more like a process standard on how to develop uh, uh, properties using interconnected dictionaries. And then we have a standard on development of construction objects. So that would be, in this case, it could be the information container holding uh, information on what is the cost, what is the facility management, what is the embedded carbon, what is the yeah, technical requirements for either systems or products. Um, so my expertise, expertise is understanding the construction product regulation, the low wall directive, the differences between standards in um, Australia, US and Europe, and actually taking the framework of the construction industry and using that as a starting point to solve industry issues. So I hear that you're kind of technical, but uh, I'm com I come from a I come from another planet in, in these discussions because I'm not the technical guy. I have people within my company that are, and I know that mm. Peter and others have been discussing with my technical teams. So that's me. Perfect. Yeah, there's a good balance of people on this call, I think. So yeah. um, next up is Kelly, please. Sorry, first I had to come off a of mute. Um, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm I'm honored to be sitting down and, and, and talking with an impressive group of folks here today. I mean, uh, it's great to pull together all these different uh, uh, disciplines and, and, and perspectives on this. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this from from two angles. One is through the filter of my uh, software product organization and and figuring out how we transmit information between platforms. You know, one of the things we discussed in the opening was about how, uh, and I'm, I'm confident somebody else just brought it up as well, you have different organizations using different tools and there needs to be a common language to be able to move information around and have some consistency there. It's not just direct connections where it's data points to data points. There's also, uh, you know, uh, the way I look at it, there's three different kinds of information. You have graphical information, you have non-graphical information, and then you have documentation. And all of those three things have different attributes around them. Uh, documentation tends to be snapshots in time, right? It, it, it's photos, it's, it's Word documents, it's PDFs, things of that nature, which has to be classified, but it's, you're not transmitting ones and zeros. Uh, the the other perspective that I'm looking at here is uh, from my position as a moderator on the on the digital twin uh, conversation for the Construction Progress Coalition, where this container is very important, because a digital twin is nothing but a big container, and then there's lots of other containers that come together to to populate this big big container. So so the language is very important. This this common uh, common language and, and data dictionary is very important for the digital twin. But so is the plumbing that I described in, in the first piece, right? How do we move information from here to there? How do we understand what kind of information we're moving? What attributes particular do we need to know that trust, uh, that transparency that you get between these organizations so everybody has an understanding of what they're sending, what they're getting. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not coming at this from a, a pure design perspective. It's more the logistics, you know, putting my old military hat on. You've got to get stuff from here to there. Uh, so great conversation. I think all of this is going to lend to that. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Matthew Mita, please. Hi. Um, so um, I think I'm going to actually um, Thank you, Arun, for introducing the academic point of view, uh, because I already can sense some differences in how we are viewing um, what to focus on in containerization as such. Uh, I'm largely going to concur with what Arun had said about con containers, but beyond, going beyond that, um, 
Considering that containers form the smallest blocks and most common data environments already have some kind of a specification for what a container should do. Uh, I think the focus is then to see how for the AEC industry, how do we make use of these concepts to actually use them, whether it's going to be file based system or whether it's going to be completely information on the cloud in triple stores. What kind, how do we actually extend the concept of containers to make it workable? Because there seem to be not, nothing that's the perfect solution. I'm saying this uh, with experience from working in ICDD standard. It's a ISO standard that focuses on uh, information container for link document delivery. Basically what it specifies is that it defines what a container should contain, the meta information for the container and the files that it contains, what are the meta information for the files? And if they are linked together, what is the kind of link that they have? These are not too specific, but they, they contain a level of abstraction on what information basically should be there, and they define it in terms of an ontology. So it's easier when there's a standard that explains this, but there are still large gaps even in that standard uh, that they have developed. Um, and one of the things that I really find uh, we would benefit probably from this discussion today is um, beyond uh, the business point of view uh, and from the academic point of view, how is it feasible for the existing industry that is file based to implement um, container concepts from standards like ICDD or even the recent, um, I think, uh, ISO 19650. I think they also have a bit more detailed definition of containers. How How is it going to be? What more do we need to make them workable in common data environments? I think that would be a very interesting outlook. Thanks, Adumita. Um, Mo, please. Yeah. So hi everyone, um, thanks John and Rolf for organizing this and I'm really glad to be here. Um, I think like just taking it back and reiterating some of what I think everyone said in different ways, um, but like first, why are we doing all of this? We have an asset that we're trying to get to um, and that's really, really important. When we're trying to get to this asset there, when we're procuring this asset, there is a combination of people, processes, information, and tools that will enable us to get to these assets. And I use tools on purpose instead of technology because I think technology is the latest, but ultimately it's just a tool that enables us to do something. When starting to think about it in that lens, all of these things are inseparable. What makes construction, I think, specifically different to a lot of industries is that we have a, a lot of different processes that interact with each other within a certain time period and within a different configuration of people that get together that have to deliver this project and or this asset. And ultimately we need information in order to make the decisions together and then the effective decisions that we need, right? And I think everyone, or we, we get really stuck on this idea of common data environments, but ultimately we need information wherever that information is in order to make the decisions that we need to make them, or to make. Now, the problem that we have today is we've seen common data environments in a very specific way very similar to, I would say, the outside world, a Dropbox or a Google Drive. Um, in our world, they look like Autodesk Lim 360, Aconax, so on and so forth. But I mean, John, you've been talking a lot about distributed CDEs. I think that's quite an interesting concept in terms of we don't necessarily need to have all of the information in one place. Ultimately, we need to be able to access the information that we need at the right time. 
I think, and I think that that's important to think about in, in, in the discussion. We shouldn't be too stuck with what do the CDEs that exist today only look like, but also where are we headed and what is potentially a better way of doing things. I think from like from where we're sitting as a company, Morta, I think the irony for us of all of it is a lot of the standards, um, a lot of the governance documents that come out and speak about um, interoperability and harmonization, like thinking of exchange information requirements as a sample document, they tend to be quite analog themselves. And they're the ones that are meant to govern how information is exchanged on a project. So what we've been really focused on is this idea of, well, a document should actually be digital. And if it is digital, and if it does have data that's behind it, then we could potentially govern um, a lot of the interactions between different systems um, in a better way. And, 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 and like, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think that just thinking about it from that perspective, ultimately it's information, how how and what form it's in doesn't matter. Where it is doesn't matter. What matters is for us to be able to govern it effectively, access it effectively, move it from one place to the other effectively in order to save the ultimate serve the ultimate purpose, which is delivering that asset successfully. Um, and I think just like on a final note, I think there are a lot of massive organizations that have benefited a lot from the fact that we don't have um, open access to information. And that like brings me back to what like, Claudio was saying at the beginning and that the business models and every front is important. You have the big tech vendors, you have the big consultancies and contractors, you have the like effectively the standard setting bodies. And it's just, there's a lot that has to go on in order to get to this I would describe as a utopian um, accessible information world that we're all working towards in one way or the other. Thanks. Thanks Mo. Um, Peter Powells, sorry. <laughs> Could I have your perspective, please? Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you also for the very, the most elaborate introduction ever, which I found really nice. Um, um, yeah, there's so much that has already been said, so I don't really know how to add more to it. Uh, maybe you should not add too much more to it. Uh, I think that the I'll focus, I think, a bit more on the information container part. I think it's really important for really obvious reasons as well, because this is the point where you transfer information from one partner to the other, which is something that you can uh, basically contract, I think, and make agreements on, so that has a clear business value. Um, so I, I think that's really important uh, in the whole area. Um, and that is a kind of, dip, um, yeah, independent of a, a CDE concept, if you like, just exchanging data from one point to the other is really important. Then there was, it was already, already mentioned by Kelly that uh, it also has lots of different kinds of data in it. And we tend to use lots of PDFs and images and drawings and, and, and more PDFs. Um, which uh, it's, it seems that we are kind of doomed to a zip-like format to be able to just package it and send it to the other um, to the other person. Um, and okay, that's that's already a good start, and I think man, we really need this also. But I hope we can also move to something that is more um, live and direct on a structured data level, which I think is the other uh, the other aspect. Um, which the, which the linked data kind of people always refer to um, and API people uh, refer to. Um, I agree with Lars that we should not mix too many things together, but we have to, uh, especially now. Um, so if you look at it as a live network of data, I think that also contains uh, handovers uh, of data which are going through an API, which are pieces of responses on queries, which return, requests return. Just I think that's a like second level uh, implementation of a of the of the exchange, the file exchange. 
And I think both on the zip part as and the API part, we need to standardize, which is precisely what this is about. So I think that's uh, really important. I think I'll keep it to this. I think that's uh, more than enough. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Ryan, can I invite you to share your Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite today. Um, it's been interesting and good to listen to everyone's perspectives thus far. Um, I'm by no means in any way as technical or as academic as some of you, um, and purely my hat is uh, today is very much coming from a client's perspective, um, working largely within public sector. Um, and I guess the, I think it was Claudia at the very outset set the um, challenge around the business model and um, the entry point. Um, for me, um, having and dealing with a lot of public sector clients um, who don't have budgets available or time for uh, detailed uh, integration processes um, to adopt or procure what's currently available within in the market around CDEs. Um, I, I I would suggest that the challenges to the common data environment um, providers at the moment are and 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 the area of complexity um, and the fact that they're quite siloed um, and as products as, uh, in themselves. Um, and really, the, the feedback that I'm getting from public sector clients is why can we not just use SharePoint and just have a basic folder directory? And then that almost becomes our ownership of data that's given to us the key stages of the project delivery at the point of handover. Then what you do in terms of your service providers or software products is build the, build the functionality and the optionality to feed into that. Um, and I think, I think coming from that perspective, um, that's the challenge to the CDE providers and developers at the moment, because if SharePoint can host information for clients um, and um, you can build the functionality layer around that, that also allows clients to also, and other departments and other um, sectors within public sectors to share the information because they all have SharePoint. They all, they all have Microsoft Teams. Um, and, and, and there's already an uh, interoperability functionality in existence. It's just the the, the extended sort of um, usability of that, you know, across the the, the life cycle. So, um, I, I think that um, that that's the for me that's a big it's it's the big challenge for CDs providers is is how how do you uh, how, how do you start to um, it, 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 clients who have, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30, 50, maybe 100 different systems and already procured and in use. How do you start to, if they're procured a, a, a CD which is available at the moment, how do you uh, allow that CD to interact with already that, that, that technology stack which they have? And CDs at the moment don't allow, providers don't allow that to happen. So there's, a, there's an issue already that needs to be addressed. So. It, it, yeah, it's about CDs being able to to work together. Um, it's about, I guess, the challenge is about creating an, an interoperability layer for information exchange. What does that mean? Um, so, an idea potentially is: do we do we consider the idea of a top level ontology that sits sort of built above all of this and allows everything to feed up to that to allow that connectivity to happen? So, um, and I'd be interested to see whether anyone has explored that thought or has anything been developed in that area? Thanks, Ryan. Um, Masood, could I invite you to share your thoughts, please? Hello, everyone. It's uh, really good to be with you all. Um, so, uh, just on the last point about uh, a top level uh, uh, integrator of the integrator system, uh, I think yeah, that's a that's a really good option. Uh, we should be looking to develop. I'm very much interested in the uh, technical challenges we are facing at the moment in terms of uh, getting systems to talk to each other and exchange information with each other. Uh, 
previously I looked at the the marketed functionalities of the various CD providers in the uh, yeah for the AC industry, and as part of that, I was uh, I was uh, looking into you know what what are the key functionalities uh, they offer, and that allowed me to get a snapshot of the of their marketed functionalities, but I wanted to uh, learn more about uh, how integrated, you know, those solutions are. Uh, so that led to uh, a, a, a separate uh, strand of work going into, uh, you know, integrate integrate uh, uh, the the complexities, solving the complexities of the current uh, CD providers. How compl you know how complex they are. Uh, what what are they made up of, and how those different uh, uh, subsystems or modules of those CDs are integrated with one another, and uh, from there I uh, tried to understand uh, how we can use uh, uh, how we can create a map of the integrated features of of an each CD, so that uh, we can try to understand how you know, integrated they are within the Within their own system, but uh, also to understand, you know, uh, how those, how how that uh, map can be compared with other uh, CD providers. Uh, so that was that was my interest. Try to understand uh, the technical challenges uh, that you know the CD providers uh, are having to pass information with one another. So. Uh, and I, I was briefly looking into uh, uh, to ontologies to to understand uh, what what are the uh, how in how we can bring them uh, how we can understand their their features uh, and try to yeah try to uh, map them across. Okay. Thanks, Monsieur. Um, Andy Bertel, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's evening now here, so good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, and it's really, it's really nice actually to to hear you all talk before coming in, actually. And it's it's apparent to me that there's some incredibly technical, clever people on this call, and I'm coming from this as an industry practitioner. Um, I don't understand the, all the clever stuff behind the background, but I can give a perspective from trying to implement this stuff on the ground. Um, so I think firstly, John, you may I think your problem statement's spot on. Um, you know, fundamentally what we're trying to do for the here and now is automate um the exchange of information containers between solutions, isn't it? Um, because of the, and again, going back to that, you know, what's what's the business case? Well, the you know, the amount of waste and effort um, you know, with the manual transfer, and I see it as a you know, as a contractor, we're forever. You know, we, we've got a lovely system, a solution that we put in place with our supply chain, and and information moves about in containers and gets approved and 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 the like. And then at the end of the day, typically the client has a system where where a poor old document controller has to sit there and manually download and then upload. And I've got I've got a, that very example at the moment with um, um, clients got I think we've got three systems we're juggling. And, and that's all being done by a uh, dot control and manually uploading, downloading, um, creating reports, um, exporting, <laughs> exporting reports to then produce a schedule, a tracker to show that, you know, it's, it's outrageous. So <clears throat> I think it's important to focus on the problem statement here and now that we're trying to solve um, and just automating that, that transfer would be a huge benefit. <clears throat> um, excuse me. So, and I think there's some really interesting points made and what wasn't, I think Claudia made a really interesting point about IP of metadata. You know, if we are automating some of these um, files, essentially information contains between systems, if if the, that allows the metadata to come across as well, there probably does need some consideration of of what you may want to retrieve in one system and sh and push into the other. Fundamentally, if you've got a um, an agreed project naming convention, then that allows that. To come across doesn't it with the file but actually do you want to carry these other 10 15 however many bits of metadata with it or actually do i want to keep these back but i want to sh i want these to go to the to the next system and i suppose that's a would that be a, a problem statement for ve the vendors who would need to then develop how this happens 
So, you know, from, from system A to system B as, a, as an administrator, you could say, yep, I want to push this file to, to, to system B, but I, I don't want these bits of data to go with it. I want everything else. Uh, just a thought on that. And I was really intrigued by uh, Jerome's, um, uh, what something he mentioned about actually rather than moving containers, almost querying between solutions. Um, and just, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a new concept for me. And again, in the here and now, you know, at the end of the day, we, we move things from A to B because because B has, has, has had, they've got information requirements. They want to keep that in their system and have, a, have an audit trail and a history um, for legislation and other things. But actually, that's that's something we should probably think about as a, as a future state potentially. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, that's me. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, I'd like to invite Paul, Paul Wilkinson, please, for your thoughts. Um, I'm aware you missed the opening, opening, opening keynote. I, I think I, I shared the document. Did you get a chance to yeah, read? Yeah, I did. So, I did. okay. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, my perspective on this dates back to when I actually worked for one of the vendors, um, 15 years ago when several of the vendors in the UK market were put under a little bit of pressure by their customers, ultimately, uh, in many cases, asset owners, um, to put in place some kind of safety net in case one of the vendors went bust. How could a vendor, how could a customer get their data from one platform and import it into something else? Because ultimately, they wanted um, uh, a safety net. Um, unfortunately, the, the efforts of what was then the, the network for construction collaboration technology providers um, came to nothing, partly, I think, because... Sorry, someone is... Sorry, Paul, there's yeah. interference on someone's... I don't know who it is, but <laughs> yeah. could maybe mute. Thanks. I, hopefully it's not me. I've had connectivity issues today, but there, there we go. Um, but the NCCTP effort came to nothing, partly, I think, because some of the vendors um, valued the lock-in effect. They didn't want uh, to make it easy for um, end users to transfer their um, projects their legacy project information, their ongoing project information to a new system. Um, if a superior platform came along or if um, a, a better offer came along. So, you know, this lock-in has, has been an issue. Uh, I'm interested in the whole challenge because of ongoing work. Um, I touch base with Andy Bootle on a sort of almost weekly basis talking about uh, the BIM Interoperability Expert Group and the work of the UK BIM Alliance, which is focused on interoperability. And the strand of that group's work that I'm involved with is on what was called the AIM CDE, CDE the Asset Information Management CDE. But the realisation is it's not just about asset information, it's about how information is going to be used for a much wider range of purposes. Um, so simply dropping things and, and regarding it as files and documents rules out the use of some of that information in its structured data form for things like procurement, for things like compliance, for monitoring the usage, energy efficiency uh, uh, and so forth of, of, of built assets um, for decades to come, not just for three or four years the typical duration of a piece of proprietary software and I think you know this is where um, a mandate from client organizations could be immensely powerful in driving change uh, because at the moment we haven't seen that driver from the large client organizations to bring that about it's allowed the individual software vendors to perpetuate their own lock-in um, arrangements you know, things like the golden thread of building information will make um, clients much more conscious of the need to manage information across the whole life cycle. And at the moment, the software vendors are not supporting that or making it easy. Uh, if somebody comes into the marketplace and does make it easy, they're going to clean up in this space. 
or they're going to force other, you know, there'll be a disruptor that will force other people to make the change. That's part of my hope. End of rant. John, I've yeah, muted your microphone. Really, so, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what that was, Ralph. Um, but yeah. you're next, uh, so I'd like you to invite or to invite you to share your thoughts, please. OK, well, I suppose like um, let me stick, stick my camera on like Andy, I'm coming at this um, less from a technical point of view and more of a practitioner as an architect who's worked for nearly 30 years in the industry and and as a BIM consultant for the last 12 years, experiencing the, the pain that everybody's having, uh, uh, as many people have described you, yeah, of moving things back and forth. And um, and I think for me, the key driver is is uh, the cost, yeah, the time and the cost uh, of all this uh, wasteful work of not having the right information at the right time from the right people available to do the job. Yeah, is is causing enormous waste and and cost to and delays to the construction industry, which is which makes buildings expensive and slow and uh, unsafe. <laughs> yeah, so so really, we're just looking for a much better way of doing this. So, uh, so on a practical level, what what we did and what John and I spoke about was we said, w w where could we start instead of just conceptually talking about this for years on end, you know, where could we start? So we could, we could start where the industry is at today, which is the, the exchange of files. Uh, now, the, obviously, there's lots of useful information in those files, but if we just start the exchange of a file, and what would you need to know about that file if you exchange it from one platform to another? What, you know, what information would you need about that file? And the, we produced that little parameter map which we shared with everybody. Um, and the, the, our, our approach was we start with the ISO 19650 standard uh, and the, particularly the UK annex because that's a bit more detailed in what you should know about a file. And we, we started with the 10 um, codes, metadata codes that are set out in the, the annex. Uh, and it, just sort of jokingly, we, John and I sort of spoke about like a number plate for a file, like you have a number plate on a car, you know, that, that identifies the vehicle. So that the number plate would have these 10 codes, but the codes didn't mean anything unless you had some other information. So, I mean, a project code, for an example, is a is a four, four to six character code, but you want to know something more about that project, like its name, its location, et cetera, what, what sort of stage it's at. Uh, the originator code, you know, is a two character code or three, sorry, three character code. Uh, but do you want to know more? Like, what's the name of the company? Where, what's the address? You know, who are the, the, the participants uh, in that company? So just using that methodology, we expanded the 10 codes out to a number of other parameters. And we came up at the end with 140 properties that we we need, we felt we you need to know about a file to to know something about it, who approved it, who rejected it, who uh, accepted it, you know, when did those things happen, et cetera. Um, I suppose as a non-technical person, my sort of question was, um, you know, we already have existing standards through IFC and IFD and IDMs and MVDs, et cetera, which are ISO standards, European standards that describe um, objects in the the relationship of those objects was it possible to describe a, a, a file using the IFC standards so in other words the all the properties that we had listed in um, in that map that we produced the, those 140 properties yeah was it was it possible to use the existing standards instead of inventing something new uh, to describe a document as an object and my so my thought on that was in Kobe, which is a subset of IFC, documents is are documents are one of the entities that are um, provided in Kobe with a, a number of parameters. And you know, maybe using the IFC schema with the the, the data dictionary, um, we could sort of establish um, 
the, you know, the, the properties for a document. Um, and that's a question for me because obviously I'm not a, an IFC expert. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has a, an answer to that question. <laughs> like I know Mo had helped us out to, to start looking at that. And Mo, I don't know if you have anything to add there. I mean, it's something that we've been starting to look at. Um, it's this idea that, um, generally speaking, with a lot of the, with a lot of, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier, a lot of the defining documents that we have um, that include exchange information requirements, BIM execution plans, so on and so forth, include the definition of the metadata that you need around the files or the information containers. And in many ways, you can start mapping a lot of this to IFC now. You, you, can't, you can't do it fully. Um, and we still haven't done it. We, we, we've only just begun trying to do that. But we think that there is potential to go down the line of providing the base data set effectively that you need to govern um, the rest of the information containers that lay within IFC. But maybe the, you know, the other way to think about it is rather than having uninformed, uneducated clients sort of making up codes and things in their uh, employer's information requirements, maybe we should work from the standards and backwards and say, here's a set of properties you know, that you should be using. And, can, uh, can I yeah. add, uh, Ralph, can I add just something here? Please, because yeah. This is almost where I explode in, inside uh, because okay. I think... <laughs> I think this approach, because oh, where to start? The, if, we, if we take Europe as a starting point, because we have to have a starting point or somewhere. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, harmonized standards uh, that uh, if we go to the, to the lower level of, uh, let's say, a wall or uh, a pump or a window or a plasterboard, whatever, we have already a framework which is mandatory under law to be used. This is how we sell products in the market. This is called construction product regulation, low volt directive, reach, and things like that. This is not BIM, this is mandatory. This is today how architects uh, or anyone that wants to, do, to specify, uh, like NBS, anyone which is using a, any tool or developing any tool, have to use this technical language to describe what's the light transmission, what's the fire, wind, water, whatever. These are test methods for Europe. So that if you want to get your product to market, you have to test your products and, and, and then you can go to market with your products. And now we have BIM and we're talking about um, common data environments and information containers. So, what is important if you go in that direction, what you just said there, Ralph, is that you could, if you look at the document, you can actually in reality, and this is the important part, I tried to write it in the, in the, in the chat, you can then develop the information container talking about windows, just as an example. Uh, you can classify that using Uniclass, Omniclass, Co-class, E-class, Uniclass, whatever classification. Still, you have the official European document, which is used in all European countries with specific properties talking about what is the width, what is the height, what is what. That's within that official document. That is uh, then providing, uh, so the, the, the purpose of these documents is actually providing the technical language for architects, engineers, manufacturers. So what I think is important is that when we're talking about data and data exchange, there is kind of this, um, uh, these documents are there and this needs to be taken into this discussion. That's number one. Secondly, if you, if you look away from, the docu from these documents, the standardization in SEN442 has developed two standards. I think one of them is very useful. It's called ISO 23386, and it actually 
gives you an opportunity to, to describe a document type. This is just a use case. So let's say that I'm an organization and I would like to describe a document type. So how do you do that? OK, then you have to set in place uh, people uh, which agree on uh, what a document type should be named. So what is the name of this document type? And then you have to describe it with text, what it is. And then you have an author. Then you have a date. So there's a lot of attributes about, around there. And that is then, uh, then you're using a dictionary to get a GUID, which you can put into, uh, let's say, either an attribute. I'm not a technical guy here, but you can actually use that GUID to say this is a document of a specific type. So I, in, in Norwegian, I can call that, in my language, something. And in English, you could call it something else. That's, a, that's the, the use of, of the dictionary. But the dictionary provides you with a GUID. That GUID could be used by many. So one of the main, main problems we have as an industry is that we are not standardizing. We are allowing everyone in their Excel sheets to sit and do whatever they like. And that's the purpose of the ISO, ISO 23386 standard is to have experts, experts to agree on concepts. So it's a process. Mm. So I think- So can, so yeah. can we take that, that ISO standard as a methodology to define the properties of a a file or document. That that's the purpose of the standard. Yeah. This is the of French that, that... which kind of made this. Uh, it's called PPBIM in the beginning, but now it's an ISO standard. How how to develop properties using interconnected dictionaries. Yeah. So if if I don't know if you had a chance to look at that map that we had put together of the 140 properties. Um, it, you know, now that was that wasn't that was just in plain English, basically um, thinking about the things we need to know about a project, the, the originators, the yeah. etc. Et so, are you saying it's it's possible now to take that as a base point and now using the ISO 19, oh sorry, the ISO 2386 um, standard, we can develop that further and begin to structure those properties. In, yes. a, in a standardized way that you could use all around the world. So yes. that everybody exchange a file. Yeah, you know, it's exactly the same. So so property. so in 23386, the only thing is that you always work in English. So everything has to happen in English. That's a requirement. Uh, so you have to describe it and then you have to describe it, give it a name in English. And then from a perspective of any country, you can translate that to your language. So that, but you still keep the, 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 the concept, the GUI, the concept is still always the same. But that's why you need all the attributes to describe in reality, how do you measure it? Is it in kilos? Is If it's a property, you need kind of yeah. enumerated values. There's a lot of things linked to this property thing. Can, can I ask you one practical question? How long does it take? There's 140... Let's just say we agreed. I know we don't, but let's say we agreed there's 140 properties we need to know about a file or a document. Yeah. How long does it take to do what you just said? Is it like five years or no, no, five no, no, months no, no. or five it's, minutes? <laughs> the, 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 the thing is that uh, when you describe it, there is uh, some attributes you need to write, for instance, a uh, um, uh, technical specification. What is it? So someone needs to write uh, all the, let's say, all the technical specification of what we're talking about. So the standard is telling, advising you to, to, to let's say, have uh, attributes. So in reality, to develop that, if you have, uh, if this is the, if this is developed by experts, it's more like just developing developing it, and then you have the GUIDs, and the GUIDs always have the the name. The explanation, all these things, it's there. Yeah, if I could jump in there just a quick bit, um, you know, when, when I look at the map and you talk about these 140 different pieces of, of attributes about a particular file, Ralph, some of that, like who touched it last, uh, you know, who in a series of five people have actually touched it, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be captured in the metadata on a particular uh, file. Uh, so where, uh, you know, when we're moving a piece of content from one place to another in Project Ready, and and that 
that file has a certain metadata attribution in SharePoint, let's say. Um, as it moves through our system, we are capturing those touch points that associate with that specific file. And we could have a package of 100 different files. We're capturing who touched what files at what time and date timestamping, all that stuff. So we can create associations to capture that information and report on that information without actually having to cram it inside the container. So now I guess the trick is, well, how do you get this captured information and make it available to everybody else? That's the next level of the discussion, right? But when you're, um, I, I feel like you, there's only so much information you can pack inside that little container and put eight pounds in a six pound bag, right? So, so let's figure out ways to what information do we need and then look at what are the ways that we can uh, associate across. Does that make sense? Okay, guys, I'm 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 the practical guy. I'm a carpenter as an education in the so I'm a practical guy. So I challenge you guys to to give me uh, uh, an, a use case something, and in return I will provide you back with a standardization of uh, whatever property, which could be, in this case, it could be a document of a type. It could be a property, let's say fire, uh, or it it could be a name of, um, let's say, it could yeah, it could give me anything, and in return I will provide you back um, a concept where it's undisputable what this is, and that you can provide a GUID. A concept GUID for the, when we are enlarging the scope. It de depends on what we're talking about. Because if we're talking about fire, then you have two GUIDs because you have an enumerated value of uh, the fire, uh, like EI30 has a GUID and the, the name has a GUID. So then I can provide you with a common language that are undiscussable. It cannot be, it cannot mm. not be because. The purpose of it is to have experts agreeing. And if experts agrees, then, uh, uh, and of course, if you give me something which is specific for Europe, like a European standard or something, then Europe, and if it's Australia, it's Australia, but still same concept. So a common language. That um, is maybe a, you, this might be too big a use case, but a building burns down and 70 people get killed. Yeah, and you're trying to trace now where the hell did it go wrong? <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, that, that, that's a big use case. I'm, I'm just saying <laughs> when we are talking about the information containers, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere you need. Yeah. To start. Well, there, there was an exchange of information that happened on that project, and and things went wrong because people lost track of the information completely. You know, the the the, the people building the building. Completely ignored the design yeah. information, changed it uh, on purpose with the aim to save some money, and the design team didn't pick that up. You know, and you know, information was scattered all over the place. And the lawyers now that are trying to get their hands on the information to see who they should uh, pursue yeah. in terms of those seventy deaths have you know have very little <laughs> way of of tracking that. So that's like that's the use case on one. You know, like you're trying to save people's lives, and you you're trying to save money, and you're trying to make the whole system work a lot better by having so, a record of information. Ralph, I need to run, but uh, I saw yeah, yeah. The, the information container map, so I thought that it was something related to that that we could start with. My my yeah. point, just trying to 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 have this golden thread, common language. What is what? That's where I think that I can provide uh, both uh, the uh, understanding, common understanding, and to explain how this 23386 standard can help all the actors in the industry with this question. Yeah. Because this well, has I, I, spent a lot yeah. of time, and I, I think it's really valuable to, to have a look at, at, uh, at this process uh, and, and, and the outcomes of, the, of this process and how you, you model it, data model it. Yeah, well, I think that's a good starting point, Lars, and we probably come back to you. That, you yeah, know, those hundred. There's 140 attributes. Some people might agree 
that's too much. Some people might say it's too little, but it's a starting point that we've put together. Yeah. Um, and we didn't just make it up. Like we we started with the ISO standard. We went mm. from you know went into the UK annex and we expanded that out. So, um, but you know we might come back to you and say like how would we? Yeah. What's the next next step? How do we take those 140 properties and how do we use leverage existing standards that are out there, dictionaries Absolutely. and and, and, yeah. and that's why I'm saying so. So that would be an honor to do it to 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 showcase this because I think that as an industry we need a common language and and this is more on the generic level. We need a common language. It's not saying nothing. No one has any wrongdoings here. I'm just saying that my passion is people needs a common way of doing things. And that's yeah. where we have to bring in knowledge and processes, data governance, machine readable data, GUIDs. Yeah. I mean, has anyone looked at the, the parameter map and said, this is complete rubbish. These guys don't know what they're doing. Oh. <laughs> John, okay. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like to just bring the conversation back to some of the principles that I feel are important to define before we even start talking about metadata. Like for me, I think one of the big one of the big things that Lars brought to the table today was not the fact that he could classify our information um, or or those 140 fields, but how user cases for the information containers were driving their content and how for instance with the product or with the product data templates the content or the specification for the information that defined products related to or that need to be uh, i suppose validated um by, was by like law and legislation around um like given given objects like greenfield, like greenfield greenfield is just a good example golden thread where is the data so but please don't say product data template say data template for construction objects it could be anything so basically what i'm saying is that i'm just providing because I I have uh, uh, ten people in my R and D department working with what you guys are doing. I'm not a research guy, but I have a lot of people yeah. working on it. So to 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 go move forward in discussions like this, I think we need to put something on the table, and it would be a pleasure to jump into it from my end if we can uh, uh, contribute, and then for this for everyone to use it. It's not like but that's the, but that's that's I suppose the pain point and what I was trying to get at there was that even if we take the 140 metadata properties and you go and do the work to define these in um, you know language that's compatible with ISO and European um, or whatever it may be me as a system integrator or maybe Aconex as a vendor our needs may not be met and what i'd like to do is discuss the needs mm. of all stakeholders from a higher level rather than trying to jump in and say okay we need this 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 and this because f for me for instance as a system integrator and kelly brought it up um that yes, he doesn't want to have in a file name, he doesn't want to have all of the provenance of all the systems that that file touched. But for example, if we want to decouple the information container from the system completely, and we want to have this as, a, as an independent vehicle traveling through the full life cycle of the project, I want to ask the question, is it feasible to have, you know, um, I suppose, 10 different systems of record where that information container has traveled through and left some logs of different transactions that it has gone through or would a better approach to be actually to be thinking you know what every system should put all of the transactions and logs and changes hey, John, that this John, information I, container has taken place on John, the information I, container itself 
So, so John, I, I really think you're on it. That's what's my point. I think that common data environment discussion is not enough because that information lives within the manufacturer's PIM. That information lives within the ordering process using a GS1 standard like barcodes. That information is living with a digital twin in the future in 2028. So common data environments is not enough. So when we're talking about the information container, my point is that it's much bigger question than talking about common data environments. That's my point. And the, the development of trusted properties or trusted data that can be used by anyone. This is an API tech, uh, way of thinking, guys. It's like an API. Yeah. Can I can I jump in here because I think we are all um... data environments, or whatever. So, so that's my take on it. Much bigger. Yeah. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, Claudio. Please. Hi. So I just want to jump in again. I'm hope I'm not um, stepping on somebody else's time, but. Um, <clears throat> Perhaps there is a little bit of a misconception that we are um, meeting here because um, we seem to, I mean, the industry was very smart the, the <laughs> in making us think that we have CDEs and we don't um, because we have a few tools around that uh, allow us through a custom user interface to uh, upload a file, download a file, and you know, do a few things that that you know, because we didn't have anything at the beginning, uh, we are happy that we have these things now. <laughs> but a common data environment, if you go back um, um, and look at the ISO standard, uh, I'll read from for you now. It says that it's just an agreed source of information for any given project asset for collecting, managing, and disseminating each information container. Don't have that. We have a mechanism that allows us perhaps to collect, yeah, manage, yeah. I don't know of thing of, of mechanisms that are currently available in any of the tools out there to do the dissemination part effectively. So what we are currently seeing out there are partial solutions to a common data environment proposition that we have in a standard that doesn't really quite exist yet. Um, so now the dissemination part is thrown in in the standard as a, you know, a small word just there <laughs> that perhaps they missed, but that's a big deal. So the dissemination. It, I, sorry, go on, carry on. No, no, go on. Uh, I, I mean, gonna, I, you, this you, was you, just no, perhaps. You're, you're quite, you're quite right. Uh, I just. You know, uh, just we just we just have to remind ourselves the definition of a common data environment is is it's the process and workflow made up of many solutions not uh, and the disseminate could be a manual transaction or it could be automated and i think the bit we're trying to solve is is making the manual bit automated in its sim in my simplest simplest thoughts um without without trying to you know we, we could we could be here till next week talking about solving the wider issues and, and they're, they're they're absolutely relevant and pertinent but you know what? What are we at as a group here, here to try and solve? You know, in its simplest form, is what I'm coming, keep coming back to. <laughs> but all very Which valid points. Which I agree, points. and the point is that this, the things that we have out there are tools that solve, that partially solve the, the the need for a common data environment. They they don't offer the automatic dissemination. They offer automatic management, automatic storage, but not the automation in dissemination. So they are partial as tools, in my view. Okay. Yeah. I maybe Jerome, feel... could, I, if I, could I ask Jerome? Maybe I thought he made a really interesting point earlier about maybe the files don't have to travel, but just just the information about the files has to travel. Do you want to expand a little bit about on that, Jerome? Mm, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. Well, what I mean by that, or or what what like the the semantic web community or, or the idea of federated building models in total is meaning by that I think is um, and that's indeed maybe that's that's the, the greatest point of discussion whether we are talking about files or if you're talking about data and then an API um, so then you you don't really exchange the files themselves but you you just maintain 
very strictly the the concept of, of the single source of truth. So you have all your your data that's federated by the different stakeholders, and the one that is responsible for a particular data snippet just has it on their server. And you query so your the 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 for a particular use case you have your your um, front end um, application that's doing some kind of simulation and it needs so the application that addresses a certain use case states what it needs for this kind of use case and then it's up to the um, the api layer on top of it, which sits on top of the data to not exchange the entire file but to receive the information from the use case application which it uh, then then queries internally and just returns okay it maybe it just needs the fire um, fire safety value and then it returns this fire safety value and then the application is responsible for um, putting this together to perform some simulation and to the so the, the person who is uh, performing this simulation is then the one who is responsible for it. The result gets written in his personal data server. And, um, it and gets... is, is this a new concept or is it as, as other have other industries already solved this problem? You know, like what you've said there, that we're not moving massive amounts of data around you know, in files, but like, is there something we could look at that yeah, as as a sector that you don't reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. So so one of the one of the things that that they're really looking at in other sectors is to move from even even an, an API point of view, moving from just giving uh, the the um, the entire file. So what the REST API is typically doing, um, they they are. Uh, the past few years, they're in intensively developing the GraphQL ID, which is mainly doing that. You just state which information you need. And then the, gra uh, the GraphQL API returns this information. So instead of this is already a, a big move to go from files to objects with uh, certain properties. And the query is exchanged. As like, as it's like the first question is, do you have this information? And if you're keeping track, if you're standardizing how to communicate who is keeping track of information, so that becomes a quite meta. Um, if, you, if you can make this machine readable, who is responsible for what kind of data, then you can send out these queries to the right people and retrieve the data. And you're always authenticated in a certain application, which means that the result, what the application does, what the simulation does, is your information. Then and then, in a, in a later phase, this new newly generated information, which is now stored at my place, can be queried again from a totally different other application. So that that's more or less the concept there. Fantastic, Mo. You have your hand up. Is it? Or yeah. You... Um, so I I think we keep asking about a lot of the other industries and I see some comments about fintech and healthcare. Um, I definitely think there is a lot to learn from them, but I also think that a lot of people don't do our industry justice in the sense that I think the difference between construction, especially when thinking of mega projects, but even the simplest of projects, um, and a lot of the other industries are, we literally have to interface with every single industry on earth. We have an insane number of participants that have to get together with completely different configurations on a day-to-day, -day, uh, on, on a project-to-project -project basis. And while I think there's a lot to learn from um, fintech and healthcare, I don't think there has been any industry that has faced um, the magnitude of the problem and the complexity of the problem that construction faces. And even when we talk about the semant like about the internet, um, I'd argue that that hasn't been solved. We don't really reuse information at scale um, in 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 websites, right? Like we we don't re-embed information from one silo to the other. 
um, we do reference them. Yes, there are ways to do things. Yes, but we don't do it to the scale that the, our industry needs. And I just like I, I do think that it, it, it's subtle. There is a lot to learn from a lot of the other industries, but no one has really grappled. No other industry has really grappled with the complexity that we face in the built environment um, and in construction specifically. Mm. So yeah, I suppose I, like for Andy and me at the practical level, <laughs> you know, we're just trying to reduce the number of document controllers from five to two. Yeah. You know, um, you know, like that's a you know, like a really basic problem at the moment. Uh, but what but at another level of what you what you all saying, I think, is there's so much opportunity to um, improve the way this industry works. Um, you know, it's it's fascinating. Anyway, it's just a, a comment. I don't know if anybody else. Peter, you got your hand up. Yeah, I yeah, because just in general, I also appreciate very much our industry, and I also don't want to compare too much with other industries. Um, yet I do think that the the stock exchange they don't exchange Excel files uh, constantly. Uh, also, sending a rocket to the moon doesn't work with PDFs. Um, I'm not saying that we should really look at that uh, perspective. And I think there's other industries which are also um, working a lot with manual efforts, but we can learn something from them. And I think they do. I think they do. So, and I think I see you nodding. I think you agree, but I think they, um, I think we should do some effort of also going into the data and trying to connect those on an API level, which I also think we do. Eh? I really think that there's many efforts uh, looking at it, I mean, just looking that's not advertised, but just looking at initiatives like Speckle and many of those Rhino uh, Grasshopper um, initiatives, they go straight for the data and do exchange between systems. I think that's also what we should do a little bit more at least. And, and I also understand that it's, um, it is not easy for everybody, uh, so I really need a stepwise approach. So for companies, I mean, we also need to exchange files, but we should push a little bit further, I think. <laughs> which I think we are doing with our with this group, eh, with the CDE group. So I think we should. Um, and then there was ma many comments by Andy. I think I'm not sure if he is still here yes, uh, yes. of the files and the data. And I and yes, we need to standardize on file level, but let's use it also to go into the data level, which is uh, what um, Lars was pointing to. Yeah, very good. I mean, okay, we've. Probably come over time. I mean, I'm happy to carry on talking, but uh, if people have other points they want to make, um, but if, but if you feel you need to go, please don't let us keep you. Um, does anybody else have anything they particularly want to feel they want to contribute at this stage? I'm sure we're not going to solve the any anything this yeah. today, but <laughs> we, <laughs> would be uh, lovely, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but I think you know just to continue having these discussions is really important and. Uh, um, I don't know, Kelly, you might you might want to announce that you you're having a continued discussion in November, is it, with the CPC? Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe people here want to join that. Yeah. So so the Construction Progress Coalition uh, here within the U.S. tries to pull together uh, different agencies, software providers, uh, municipalities, owners, con contractors, the whole the whole nine, and we've and having an, an ongoing discussion around digital twins and the things that we need to get there because uh I'm not sure who mentioned it before but yeah 20 i think it was lars 2028 sounds about <laughs> sounds about right but there's things that we need to do now to start paving the way connecting the roads the connective tissue however you want to describe it to put these things together uh and we're really having some fruitful discussions around there november 5th is the next in the series, and you can go back and look at some of the previous ones uh, through the uh, YouTube recordings. So if anybody has any questions or interest about that, you can go ahead and message me or, or send me an, an email or get me on LinkedIn, whatever works best for you, and happy to provide you that uh, information and connection to get there. Very good. All right, John, did you have any questions that you haven't had answered? <laughs> <laughs> so, have you got more? Yeah, have been, you got more questions now than when you when you started? <laughs> uh, no, I, I I just wanted to add to Peter's last point about um, you know 
uh, trying to connect the data within different um, you know files or information containers and a speckle is solving you know trying to solve that problem and one thing that I've noticed it, you know that it doesn't solve is the contract and IP issues um, of just exchanging data um, between different parties um, you know essentially streaming the data between different different parties and one of the, the reasons that I think it's important that we are talking about information containers and snapshots in time is because they can be actually quantified in the contractual perspective and I mean one one point that I thought was really valid valid uh, amongst all the points that were made here today um, was a point from Madhumita and how she identified that the, you know, we have all these solutions as, she, as particularly her involvement in the ICDD and then Peter, Peter Powell's also, also touched on it um, having, you know, are we, are we as an industry just going to work on zi with zip files forever? Um, but one of the big challenges for me and one thing that I'd like to contain, one avenue I'd like to continue on discuss, discussing and I suppose topic of discussion is the importance of making whatever the product of our discussions as making or the importance of making the product of our discussions feasible to adopt for existing solutions and existing industry and all the different stakeholders that are actually exchanging information and involved with even touching that information, such as a system integrator like, our, like ourselves, who are merely a chaperone for information containers between solutions. Um, I think that yeah, it's been quite a quite a good conversation. And I look, I think that Ralph, I think we should, and and I'd invite the rest of you to actually come come back over to the other side of the pond to the CPC on the 5th of November where where we can continue to discuss this um, and in the meantime I think we will publish this podcast we'll attempt to um, bring or to summarize the contents of the discussion and hopefully bring it to a wider audience and um, yeah, I think as well, another thing is uh, through the discussion with Lars, I think that we, we, we've a pretty good use case, Ralph, um, one that we've been discussing with building smart in the BSDD um, and the application of the BSDD to, to what we've been discussing. I think that can be just given to Ralph or to Lars now um, and it'd be really interesting to see what he can do. Um, with the ISO 23386 um, in, in that respect. So I think from, from me, uh, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming, coming here today and discussing this with us. I think it's been a really fruitful discussion and I look forward to continuing the discussion in the next round on the 5th of November. Very good. good. So thank I don't you. know if anybody else has anything they want to add just before we go, but if you just stick your hand up. Otherwise, like I also just want to extend my thanks to everybody for your time. It's you know we greatly appreciate it. I think it's it's fantastic to get the mix of uh, experts here, uh, both from the industry side and the um, the academic side, etc. So, so all those different views have been incredibly interesting and. Um, we we hope this won't be the last time we we talk to each other and uh, we can have more of these discussions and try and push things f f forward so thank you everybody and i uh, hope you have a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon very good thank you thank you thanks guys thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, goodbye bye bye